Great. Okay, let me go back and share that again. <clears throat> right. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, this was for assignment three. Uh, and so um, this assignment required you to convert the variables H1, F, V, one through eight into a dummy variable. And so what I'm showing to you right here, uh, where you should be see my cursor circling around this thing, uh, this is showing the recode. So I, I have it going uh, recode this variable. If you got a zero, you get a zero. And this one, I told you uh, that if it's missing, that I want you to recode the missings as zero as well. Rather than keep them missing, I want you to recode it as missing. And then I use this um, all of their values option, uh, everything else convert into a one. Uh, and so I haven't done that before. I want to show you where that's at because there are shortcuts into recoding um, because uh, that's that sometimes can be very useful if it's a variable that has lots of levels to it and you don't want to go through okay then two equals that three equals that you can just go when you go into this recode into different variable okay so here's here's it's showing me saying okay this variable right here h1 fv8 is going to be renamed i re renamed, it, renamed it d8 it stands for dummy variable number eight um all right and then old new values what i did here is I said, okay, if you're zero on the old one, you could be a zero on the new one. If your system or user missing, that's the catch all. That's the one that gets all of the variables that were coded as missing variables because they didn't get valid responses. You're also going to be zero. And then I use this option down here where it said all other values equal one. Now you can do that, or you could have said, if you're a one, then you're a one on this one. If you're a two, you get to be a one on this one as well. You could you could do it either way. It's going to come out the same way. But this is just for future reference. If you have a whole list of uh, uh, a whole a bunch of levels to a variable, and you want all those uh, numbers uh, numbers one through you know whatever nine to all be collapsed down to equal a one because you're making a dummy variable, you can always just go after you've accounted for your zeros and you're missing. However, you're going to do that. You can always just go in and say, okay, now everything else convert into a one and that's and you'll get that it'll say else equals one so that that's just a shortcut uh, to do it not a huge shortcut in this particular assignment because the way that this variable was coded originally um, was that uh, it was a zero for never um, then you had a one uh, and then you had a two and then everything else was missing values and so you're so it's not a huge short shortcut for this but that, that's one possible way you could um, have have done the shortcut Okay, so there's that. Um, exit out of this, and then uh, this is always it's always good um, or useful anyway to take a look at your syntax here that goes into this output file. So it, you're seeing right here. So it's saying, okay, now I'm computing this variable, compute variable, um, violent index equals d1 plus d2 plus d3, d4, d5, d6, d7, d8. Uh, and it's showing you what you did here. And, and recall where I do that, that's in the different window, that's in compute variable. And you have to call this, this is target variable. It's not a great name for what you're supposed to put in that box because it, it's a variable, it's a new variable that you're creating. So you had to make a name up for it. And I just told you to call it violent underscore index. And then you're setting that equal to the sum of all of these variables. Now, there are also, there are shortcuts on how you do this stuff too. But for right now, we're not doing any real complex equations. This is just straight addition. And so we're just, uh, we're saying, uh, so you all can see it uh, plainly. It's just those uh, eight variables added up. Uh, and there's no, you know, you don't have to mess around with any of this stuff over here yet. And uh, there's all these shortcut stuff over here. So we're just messing around. We're just filling in this box. Uh, and then we just want to make sure uh, that we are adding up our dummy variables that we created, not the originals. Don't do the originals. You want to recode the dummies. And so long as you don't mess with this over here, uh, just keep it in file order. The dummy variables you make will always appear at the end of your variable list. And so when we look back at data view, it'll always be um, the variables that are at the very end or the very far right hand side of the spreadsheet. That's how it always puts it in. And um, so I already did this, I already made this. And so here's my, my violent index right here. And this is really common to do where people, um, 
will want to get a global sense, an overall sense of, in this case, um, how much violence has uh, individual participants experienced. And so uh, we don't want to pay, place too much faith in just one question that asks about violence. Um, we often want to give people um, as many uh, possibilities to say yes to one of these items that are all supposed to be measuring the same sort of underlying thing because uh, people may be like, well, I haven't experienced that kind of violence, that kind of violence, that kind of violence. Uh, and if you ask a really limited number of questions or if you only use a few items, you may miss out on the fact like, oh yeah, um, actually I have shot at somebody with a gun. Oh my gosh, well, <laughs> that's good information to know if you're trying to identify among your participants uh, who have been involved in violence. And so it's common, it's very common rather than just to use one variable because of the amount of air uh, involved in it, uh, when, especially in the social sciences, that you wanna have a bunch of variables um, that are all um, uh, combined together in some fashion to indicate um, an overall global assessment of how uh, violent uh, someone is. Okay, so the next thing I wanted you to do with this, after you made that violent index, and so after you use compute variable um, right there, uh, there's where it's showing it's being computed. And so that will be a variable now that you can go in and analyze so to analyze and get the information that I want you to report for this, you would have to go in and go to where it says analyze and go down to where it says descriptive statistics. And so far we're still on where it says frequencies here. So you go over to frequencies and I already have my violent index. Uh, I, I had to pick it from here and put it over there. And the next thing you wanna do is you wanna go into statistics to get, um, more than just the frequency table. We want all our measures of central tendency. So you wanna have clicked the mean, the median and the mode and the standard deviation. And then the minimum and maximum values. Don't click where it says range because that what that does is it takes the biggest value and subtracts from it the smallest value. So that's not really of much great uh, value for us. So what we want to do is click always click the minimum and maximum. So it shows you what the smallest uh, value is in the in the data uh, for the variable and what the, the largest value is for um, the variable in the data. All right, and then you go ahead and hit continue. And uh, I'll go ahead and just you know, run this again so you can see this. So it'll give us um, this statistics box right here. And so um, just to go over this, uh, from the top here, um, there are, because we got rid of the missing cases, um, everybody who is missing, we, maybe this was a foolish assumption on my part, but I said, okay, if you're missing on this, you don't recall or you don't remember if you've ever been involved in any of this violence, chances are uh, you probably weren't, maybe I'm wrong in a few cases. Uh, but um, what I said is, that, okay, if you're missing on this, I, I'm going to count you as a zero, just like the people who responded to this in a valid way and said zero. So there are no missing now. We got all of the uh, cases in this file, 6,504, zero missing. Um, so the average response is 0.7998. And so um, uh, most people uh, are reporting no level of violence. And so, uh, cause it's uh, less than one it's somewhere between zero and one. All right, so that gives you a sense. The average uh, is, the mean of the average is, is useful in a sense that it can tell you overall what is going on with your sample. It doesn't say anything about any particular case but it says overall in the sample, how violent are these kids? Well, most of them really are not that violent at all. And that becomes quite clear when we look at the median. So the middle score, that divides the distribution, it's zero. And so uh, we look at the mode, the most popular response is also zero. So uh, the majority of people in this study um, are saying no to all of these items. The standard deviation is 1.33209. And so uh, for that means that the that's the average distance or difference from the average score. Okay, so that's 1.33. That's what the standard deviation is because no one in the study actually has the average score of 0.7998, right? You can't uh, because of the way that the thing was coded, um, but it, it shows then, okay, what is the average uh, difference from that? 
Uh, and so that's that's what that is. And then the the smallest score you get on this violent index is a zero. And uh, yeah, there are some people who said yes to all of these. In fact, there were, if we go down and look here at our, this the regular, regular, regular frequency table, we can see that the average score, or I'm sorry, the, the, that there were nine people, that there were nine people that uh, said uh, yes to all of these things. Okay, and so that was only um, one tenth of 1% of the analytic sample said this, so 0.1 is one tenth of 1%. Um, so that's a very small percentage of the sample. Uh, and uh, you can see how the majority, um, a sizable majority said zero uh, to all these things. So 60.1% of the sample said no. So those are the answers that you should get for the assignment. If you if you wanna, if it's okay if you don't turn it in until tonight, that's, that's fine. Um, are there, now after going through this, um, are there kind of procedural type questions on how to get there, on how to do that? Um, you, of course, you can always go back and look at this video, um, but the compute variable and the recode stuff is the same thing that we, we did previously. Um, so there's that. And, uh, and so, yeah, is there any questions about any, any of what I just talked about on this? Okay, so yeah, that's uh, that's what you want to do for your homework. Uh, that's that's the answers that you should get. So you can see that for yourself. You can always check this, uh, check your responses uh, to the, the video here, and see if that you see that you got that. All right. Okay, so that's uh, that is we and we will come back to this uh, computing variables. Remember, we computed the the BMI. Uh, that's what we did in class, and that was a lot more involved because that you had that was the, there was an actual. Uh, a little, not the complex formula, but there was a formula involved in the, in the BMI computing that. And so we, we, did the, we did the recodes with the height and the weight, and then we computed a uh, variable using the same procedure here, compute variable for body mass index. And so we did that in class. Well, one thing I, I didn't ask you to do this for the homework, but I'm gonna just show you how this is not um, a variable that has a normal distribution. Uh, at least the sample observations do not. So if you want to look to see how skewed this thing is, if you go here in frequencies, and this is just something that we might take a deeper look at here in the future, but uh, you know, histograms sometimes, graphical visual aids are, are nice sometimes. You can just see how lopsided the distribution is and just give this thing a moment and it's uh, it's making my histogram yeah so this is what you call a highly right skewed or positively skewed distribution it's called positively skewed because the tail is going in the positive or the high end of the high direction so you can see how this is not like you know it's not like the the, the, the highest bar the most common givenly response is not right in the middle of the distribution it's it's a uh, <clears throat> it's not around a four uh, you got it uh, way you got it way over here sitting at zero and then you get quickly diminishing returns when you go out higher on the violent index so um, yeah that's what's called a right skewed distribution or a positively skewed distribution it's right skewed or positively skewed because that's where the t the tail is and statisticians call this the tail and uh, you know the, where the bulk of the the people are that's the body so you have you have a right tail or a positive tail and a, a left tail or a negative tail and so when you have a, a bell curve, which we'll talk about that today, that has um, that that is that is a distribution that's perfectly symmetrical. And so it's it's assumed. It's assumed that when if you were to uh, do this survey all over again and use the identical methodology, um, you would get um, a bunch of different violent index scores. Now, if you were to plot those those would form a normal distribution or a bell curve or a Gaussian curve. That's how inferential statistics stuff we'll get into in a little bit here works is because while individual samples and individual variables, variables, many of them will not have a normal bell curve distribution, they'll be skewed. However, in theory at least, uh, if you were to go out into the world and do this all over again, collect data from 6,504 people and do it repeatedly, um, do it like a hundred times and then plot the average response from the violent index, it would start looking like a normal curve. 
it's going to be some variation. So you'll get, you'll get, uh, you know, you'll get some samples, you'll find they'll have a, a mean or an average that's a little bit above this. Some averages will be a little bit below this. Um, now, it, it wouldn't be quite normal yet at probably 100 samples. You go up to 1,000 samples, it's going to get even more and more normal looking. You go up to like 10,000 samples, it gets even more looking, more normal looking. And as they say, as the sample size or the number of samples itself approaches infinity, um, then it's going to look like a perfect bell curve distribution. Even though the individual variables themselves are not uh, don't have that bell curve shape to them. Uh, if you do, uh, if there is a, a large uh, sampling of samples from the population and you plot those, you start plotting the averages of those on a, on a, on a frequency, on a histogram like this, those will start forming a bell curve. Okay, so that, that forms the, uh, the assumptions uh, behind inferential statistics, and which is something that uh, that's what most of the time statisticians are really interested in. They're not so much interested in descriptive stats because you, you, you know, it's, there's no mystery to it. Okay, you got your sample, it's imperfect, it's supposed to be a representative of a population, but there's flaws to it. Uh, but we can assume though, if you have a large sample with some margin of error, we can say something with confidence about this larger population that we're really interested in. That this is just kind of a sampling of this population that in theory is supposed to be infinite and we can you know you never can take a big sample of infinity you always have infinity left over but the idea here is that you're taking um a representative sample uh, and with 6504 people um yeah this is probably representative of of the population of high school sophomores the average age for these okay so um let me Stop sharing this for a second, and let me go into this slideshow that talks about um, what Z scores are. All right. So um, now this is something that you should have covered in your uh, in your stat class, Math uh, one hundred and fifty five. Sometimes uh, there, there is a, a good reason that you would want to what's called standardize scores. A standardized score is a Z-score. A Z-score is a standardized score. They mean the same thing. Okay, so when you standardize scores, uh, you are making it so that they are always going to be on this, uh, the same scale and they are always gonna have a fixed mean and a fixed standard deviation. Um, so there is a PDF on Moodle that is just like three pages long. Make sure and read that uh, because that gives you some examples of why you would bother to do this. Um, but anyway, let me go through this slideshow and just talk to you about this for a little bit. So, um, what a, what a standardized score means is that uh, if you have some range of variables, let's say that the range is um, you know zero to a thousand, and you have some mean, you have some standard deviation. Once you have standardized it, it's always going to have a mean or an average of zero, and there's going to be a standard deviation of one. Okay, that will always be the case once you have standardized your scores. Um, and it's going to range uh, approximately from negative four to positive four in practice. That's going to be the now the, the new range of the variable. But in but really, uh, at least in theory, it's supposed to be infinite. But that the this is this is the the tail ends of that bell curve distribution. So the the far uh, left hand side or the negative side, uh, the low side on the variable is going to be negative four, but really it's thought to be um, infinite in practice. You usually don't see z-scores really much you know, higher uh, in absolute terms or greater in absolute terms and like a, like a, a two or, a, or maybe even a three, but um, just I put four in there to go to the extremes. So but really it's infinite because you can have z-scores up to you know, 10 or 12. And that's like, you know, I don't know what that would be. That's like, you know, one, one thousandths of the, of the population or something like that would be on there. Uh, so, you know, like you know, Einstein levels of of intelligence, or or uh, or Brady level of accuracy as a, of as a quarterback, just you know, people that are so so far out there in their performance, it's it's very extremely extremely rare. Okay, so 
that's uh, that's about the the basic parameters of z-scores. Um, so why would you do this? Uh, well, if you want to make apples to apples comparisons, as they say, between two different scores that have different ranges, for example, the ACT and the SAT, they have different ranges. The ACT, I think, what goes up to 28 or 30, and then the SAT goes up to, uh, I don't know, 1,000 or something like that. Well, if you have people with two different scores, uh, people with scores from um, those tests, and they're, you know, the scores could be, um, you know, the scores are going to be very different by definition because they're on a different scale. You can't make direct apples to apples comparison just com just comparing their raw scores. They're not directly comparable because they're in different scales. Okay, so what you would have to do is you want to convert their score into a Z score, convert the ACT score into a Z score, and convert the SAT score into a Z score. Then you can make apples to apples comparisons. Okay. Um, so this is, for example, this informs us where any given individual score falls relative to other scores in the distribution. So a Z-score of a two on the SAT indicates that this test taker uh, did better than about 97.7% 97, 97 of other test takers, or about 2.3% did better than that said test taker, okay? So I'll, and I'll show you how, where I got that, uh, the 97.7% from in a second. Um, uh, likewise, this tells us that the probability of doing better than that said test taker is only about a 0 0.023. So they'd be pretty hard to beat. So they, they had to compare to other people, they got a really, a really high score. Okay, so uh, you know, a probability of 0 0.023 is the same thing as saying 2.3%. Okay, that's mathematically equivalent. All right. Um, so uh, in the z-score table, which we'll look at in a moment, it's showing you probabilities, but you can read it as percentages as well. Um, the other, uh, another really good reason uh, to bother with converting standardized, or I'm sorry, converting your raw scores, whatever has been recorded in your survey into the standardized or z-scores is because you might want to combine um, values from variables that were measured differently, that is, they have different ranges, all into the same global index or scale. Like, for instance, what we did for um, the violent index, um, what we did there is we, we converted um, all of those into dominant variables. We really didn't have to do that, actually, because they were all measured the same way. They were all measured 0, 1, 2, and then the rest were missing values. Well, that's, that's great if a survey um, has that consistency across items, but what if you had items that were going from like one to five and then some that just went from zero to two? Well, you can't just straight add those up because what happens is um, th those, those variables that happen to have a larger range will contribute more to the average uh, than the variables that have a tighter or smaller range. And they may not indicate that the person really is any more violent uh, it's just that it's just by the nature of the way that the survey item was crafted, they have uh, a range of one to five where other items that also measure violence, uh, they only have a range of zero to two. And so in that case, you would want to convert each one of those variables into a standardized version of itself. Okay, so that's another reason for doing that. Um, so yeah, for example, you can have items that one scale is ordinal, another variable is interval, another one is ratio, but they're all measuring the same thing. They all could be measuring, they all could be indicators of crime, they all could be indicators of health, they could all be indicators of depression. Uh, but because they all have different ranges, you can't just straight add them up and say, okay, this is my summative or overall uh, cumulative index of depression or, or crime. What you'd want to do is you would want to convert those into z-scores. All right. So the z-score formula, how do you convert something into a z-score? It's, it's really, it's pretty straightforward. So the z-score is equal to the original score of whatever the person got minus X bar, which is the average or the mean, divided by S, which is the standard deviation. That's all it is. Um, and so when you do that, um, you can do that for individual cases, you can do that for entire variables. When you do that, um, what it does, it converts it so that uh, now your mean uh, will be a zero and your standard deviation will be a one. I'm not sure what the range will be because that varies depending on the variable, but it'll always be the case um, that if you do it for an entire variable, um, your, your mean will be zero and your standard deviation will be one. 
uh, for that. That's by definition, that's what it means to, to standardize something. So now you can make comparisons across different tests. Uh, you can take uh, variables that are measured in completely different ways and combine them all together like we did for the violent index. So it's very useful for those, for those purposes. Okay. Um, let me, uh, any, are there any questions on that? I want, do want to go to the PDF and just show you guys a couple things on there uh, that you might want to take a look at yourself uh, and just, uh, just review. Um, by the way, the homework, uh, well, geez, sorry, 11.35. Well, we will, I think we'll start with the homework. That homework, we're going to do that in class with Z-scores. And so you just, just copy, just, and you can then you reproduce it yourself. Um, but I want to, I want to uh, go into this uh, PDF. Let me find it. Where do I got this? Somewhere. No, well, maybe not. Let me pull this PDF up real quick that has, oh, okay. Maybe it will show me, show it now. Uh, sorry folks, just bear with me for just a second and then I'll try to get this thing to come up. Cause this gives you a couple uh, practical examples of what, why you would bother to do this. Okay, so yeah, here's, this is, this is on, <clears throat> This is on Moodle, so just read, this is like three page, three or four pages. Uh, the standard normal curve or, or normal curve, uh, that, that's, 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 that means the same thing as a z-score distribution, as a standardized distribution. They're, they, all, they all mean the same thing. So the normal curve is the bell curve. That's the Gaussian curve named after the statistician Gauss. Um, who was this one of these uber geniuses, polymath person, kind of like Ben Franklin. He was into all kinds of stuff, but he discovered this. He's like, this is, this occurs all throughout nature, all throughout the social world and the physical world. This is something uh, that uh, is like, it's discovering one of these mathematical truisms that, uh, you know, that we ever communicate with aliens. They'll understand what a bell curve is. They'll understand that traits usually are distributed along in this normal way. If you have a very, very large sample, Okay, so um, here is a picture of uh, a, a, a bell curve. So it's perfectly, perfectly symmetrical. So this is right here. This is 50% of the distribution. Over here is 50% of the distribution. Add this up, all up. This is equivalent to 100% of the distribution. Okay, and so right here in the middle here we see this is where normally our average score would be or the mean would be so it's saying okay that here it's a zero because if if a variable is converted into a standardized scores the average is always going to equal zero and the standard deviations will always equal one okay and so um it's saying here this is this when you go out if it's standardized uh, if it's a normal distribution um what will happen is uh when you go out uh, one standard deviation to the left or the negative side, one standard deviation to the right or the positive side, a perfectly normal distribution that will always equal 68, a little bit above 68% of the distribution will be encompassed, encompassed by um, one standard deviation uh, above the mean and one standard deviation below the mean. Okay, always and forever. It's one of these mathematical truisms. That's just the way it works. Uh, if it's a perfectly, perfectly normally distributed variable, that's the way it will work. Um, if we go out two standard deviations, so uh, two standard deviations above the mean, two standard deviations below the mean, what you're going to get, that's going to equal a little bit above 95% of the distribution. Uh, to be exactly precise, it's 95.44%, you know, right about 95%. Okay, and then if we go out three standard deviations, uh, that is going to equal 99.72% uh, of the distribution. So that will encompass, so uh, the people that are above that or below that are at the real extremes of some distribution. It could be height, it could be intelligence, it could be um, ability to uh, how much, you know, how, how many hot dogs can you eat in a hot dog eating contest or something like that. There are going to be people that, you know, they can't tolerate it at all at all. Just, you know, the smallest amount of them will make them puke. And then there's people that, uh, that, that can just eat. And it's just amazing what they can do with their potties. And so uh, that's just a 
couple of human examples, but you also see this in nature. You see this in physics. You see this all over. When you take a large enough distribution, a large enough sample, and you start and you plot it, uh, you will get this. You will get this uh, this normal curve. And these are this is what's called the areas under the curve. Um, so we just discussed. Uh, uh, how much area you're covering. If you go above one, you go one standard deviation above, one standard deviation of below. This area right here is 68% about two, uh, two above, two below. That'll be 90, 95, a little bit above 95%. And then three below, three above, that's going to be a little bit above 99% of the distribution. Okay. So that's, that's what we're talking about. Just to give you a visual aid when we're talking about uh, the, um, the amount of, uh, what is covered, the percent of the distribution is covered uh, in a normal curve. Okay, uh, here is an example of uh, people looking at uh, scores on the ACT versus the SAT. And so these are these awful standardized tests. I'm sure all of you had to take one of these things. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the, the ACT has a much smaller range than what the SAT does. The SAT is, I think, I don't know what the high score, maybe a thousand. Uh, and then the, the, the ACT, I think the high score may be a 30. It's like a 28 or a 30. So you can't, like if somebody's saying, hey, what'd you get on your test? I got it, you know, so-and-so. And I'm like, well, I took the SAT and I got this. Like, whoa, your score's in the hundreds. You can't, you can't make apples to apples comparisons doing that if they're on different scales. Now, if they're on the regular percentage scale, you can do that. I mean, that's that we do that all the time. Like a 95% compared to a 95% is 95%. That's just what it is. It's already on a standardized percentile scale. That that percentile scale is by definition standardized because a percent is a percent is a percent. But when you when you have a, a scale that has different ranges, um, what you have to do is you have to convert it into a Z score to make apples to apples comparisons. Um, okay. And so um, if someone said that, oh, I got a 15 on my ACT or, and this person got a 400 on their SAT, if we put it through the Z-score equation, so it's um, their score minus what the average score was for all test takers. And though it, so I, I guess in this case for the ACT, it was 20, for the SAT it was 500. And then you divide by the standard deviation um, for everybody that took the a a a a ACT and then everybody that took the SAT. What you get then is this equation, you get a negative one in each case. So that's a negative one Z score. So um, they are you know, right here on the distribution. So they did exactly the same. Well, mathematically equivalent the same. The person who took the ACT uh, did uh, mathematically equivalently the same as the person that took the SAT. Their scores are statistically no different from one another. Even though the raw scores obviously are different. You got a person who got a 15 on the ACT and you got a person who got a uh, 400 on the SAT. Well, it turns out though that those scores that we wanna make the apples to apples comparisons, um, what, we, what we find uh, is that uh, they have, uh, they have uh, a uh, mathematically or statistically the equivalent or the same, uh, the same score. Okay. So that's how you would uh, that's how you would you would take an individual score and convert it uh, into a, a z score, and I mean you could do this for a, for a variable too. You would just tell the computer, okay, I want a standardized version of this variable, and you say it's going to be equal to the participant score, and then you have to know the average score and take and then subtract it from the average. And then you look at the what the sample standard deviation is for that variable, and then divide by the standard deviation, and you hit OK for your recode, and it, it does it, and then it'll convert it into it'll convert it to a z score. Um, and so we we do that sometimes uh, uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, one of which is like I said, if you have you have uh, variables that are all kind of measuring the same thing, violence, health, what are academic ability, but you want it, to, but you have them from variables that have different ranges, then you, yeah, you have to convert it into z-scores. Um, over here are um, a couple examples of uh, where uh, they are showing you um, the, the distributions uh, broken down a little bit further into percentages. And so, um, you know, this right here, this 34.13% is just, you know, this thing broken into two. It's just 68.26 divided by two. So this chunk right here, 
from zero from the mean to a negative one standard devi deviation that accounts for 34.13% of the distribution. And over here, this would account for 34.13% of the distribution. It's symmetrical. It's perfectly, perfectly symmetrical. So it's, it's always going to be the same on both sides. Um, and so this is, and this is a further breakdown going further out. Uh, and it's just showing you um, where, how that compares then to some of these, these tests like the GRE, the SAT, the ACT, and these different uh, IQ tests uh, that uh, turn out with a large enough sample, you'll get a, you'll get a normal distribution. And so, um, you know, for these, <clears throat> these IQ tests, the average for the population is, is uh, uh, 100. And for the, you know, the Wilshire IQ test, uh, it's 115, 115, one standard deviation above the mean. That's used to be traditionally, that was where most college students fell was about one, on average, about one standard deviation above the mean compared to the population. So, um, um, okay, so that's, that is a visual look at, at Z-scores and how we um, think through them uh, visually. It's very helpful, or at least for me anyway, it's very helpful um, to, to look at this stuff just visually and kind of just stare at it for a little while and uh, understand what's going on, that, that there's the symmetry here, um, that uh, there is, um, it's always the case that if you go out, um, one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below, it'll always account for six, about 68%. You go out two, it'll kind of account for two, two in both directions. So two, two above, two below, that'll count for 95%. You go out three, it'll count for um, uh, over 99% of the distribution. Um, okay, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop We'll stop here because the class time is about up. However, what I'd like you to do is please take a look at that, uh, that next assignment, assignment four. It's not due until the 15th, but it's asking you um, to uh, take a look at um, Z-scores. Uh, in addition to that, it's, it's talking about um, uh, standard deviations around the mean uh, and some of the things that we talked about today. So take a, take a look at that before we meet on Wednesday. We will work through that on Wednesday. Uh, and then also, uh, I think probably by Wednesday night, I will have your first exam. So this is the last material that we're going to cover uh, in preparation for exam one. So you're going to have your descriptive stuff. There's going to be some recoding exercises, some basic questions on there about ordinal interval ratio and nominal variables. Uh, and then a couple, uh, you know, Z-score problems on there, um, and uh, and that that'll be it. So that will be your first exam. I'll give you about a week to do it, but yeah, that'll be posted by either Wednesday or Thursday of this week, and it'll be due about a week from then. Uh, but yeah, we'll do the Z-score exercise and, and the stuff that's on that assignment four. We'll work through that on on Wednesday, and then we will. Uh, uh, if you have questions about anything on Friday, the, the test should be posted before Friday. So if you have questions about that, you can also meet with me on Friday. Um, but I think uh, that is about that about does it. Um, let me see. Are there uh, questions about anything, especially especially with that homework three folks where you had to make that index? Um, now would be a good time to bring it up. I can stick around for a few extra minutes with people or we can or you know, whatever you want to do. But uh, if you are, if you're, if you're all good to go, you did that, especially if you did that assignment three, and like, I, I know how to do this. I got the answers. I saw that what he got, and I got those answers. Then yeah, uh, you're good to go. Uh, but if there's something you want to ask me about, stick around, and I will, I will be happy to chat with you. But that's all, folks. So bye-bye. If you're all done uh, for today, I'll see you all on Wednesday, okay? I have a question. Sorry, yes. I lost my voice a little bit. Okay. But um, so I have a question about uploading it. Like I got everything right, like when we went over it. So I'm unsure how to put it into a Word document. So I just took a screenshot of the output and then inserted it into a Word doc. Um, oh, you you well, that might be be okay. But all you have to do, let me let me show you this. All you like, have to I don't, do. Yeah. But sorry. Go ahead. But, so like I I can like get it where I can save it onto my laptop, but I'm unsure how to like transform that into a Word document. Yeah, all you have to do, let me, I'm gonna share my screen with you just so you can see what's going on here um, because uh, yeah. Um, so so with this right here, so here's uh, here's the information. Can you, can you see that? Okay, Margaret? Okay, yeah. so all you have to do is right click, copy, and then oh okay yeah all you got to do is that 
and then just go in and I'm gonna see, you know, and paste, paste right it. there. And there you go. Okay. Yeah. That's all you gotta do. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a nice day. You too. Bye bye.